Cool. So this is 10 Weird Ways to Blow Up Your Kubernetes. Uh, who are we? I'm Melanie. That is a great photo of you, Melanie. I didn't have as good a photo, so <laughs> this is me. I'm Bruce. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we're here to talk about Kubernetes at Airbnb. Uh, very briefly in one slide, uh, started from the bottom, and now we're here. Uh, but it's not all successes, so like, we're here to talk about the spectacular pitfalls, mistakes, and challenges we've run into um, in the past few years at Airbnb. Um, and by the way, this is 10 weird ways to blow up your Kubernetes, not 10 ways to fix your Kubernetes. So please, no judgment. These are not all perfect solutions. Some of these are like ugly hacks, and other things are just stuff that didn't work. So enjoy. First up, zombie jobs. So Kubernetes jobs and cron jobs are really great, we, and we use them a lot at Airbnb. They're a nice, distributed, highly available cron job solution. We use them for a lot of things. But we have this problem, and many of you have probably seen this. When does a cron job end, or a Kubernetes job end? If you have a typical job that might have some sidecars that do uh, support services, like a network proxy or a logging agent, those run forever, and Kubernetes jobs don't end until all of the containers exit. So this is really a struggle. Kubernetes provides you this feature to try to deal with this. You can set active deadline seconds. Uh, in order to get that to work properly, you need to also set the concurrency policy and the restart policy. But suppose you do this, you, you still have a few problems. First is it will appear as if your cron jobs are always running uh, because Kubernetes hasn't killed it yet until the active deadline seconds expire. So you don't really know how long they're actually running. And secondly, when Kubernetes finally kills a job based on it reaching, it, it reaching acti active deadline seconds, it marks the job as failed. So if you go to, say, kubectl get and take a look at what's going on in your cluster, looking at one of your jobs, you'll see the current one always running and all of the previous ones always failed. You don't really have good insight into what's going on with your cron jobs. So there's a simple solution to this, right? Just use touch files. Have your main container touch a file to indicate that it's finished and have the sidecars exit when that file appears. So <clears throat> I suggested this, gave it to Melanie as a project to work on. Uh, on it. Uh, so I'm a lazy engineer, and the first thing I do is Google to see if anyone has run into the same problem so that I can steal their solution. Uh, so I found a GitHub issue, better support for sidecar caners in batch jobs. Same thing, jobs not exiting, um, not really a great solution here, uh, great. Uh, scroll down on the GitHub issue, looks like jmilliken-stripe is the winner, pasting bash code directly into the issue. Seems like I can just introduce some of that and see if it works. Uh, so the way this kind of, uh, the way the solution's outlined is that you have a main container and a sidecar container. Uh, the main container writes touch file when it exits, and the uh, sidecar container runs a wrapper script that looks for that file to be written, and then ex exits itself when it sees that it has been written. Uh, so I actually just took the bash script from the Stack Overflow post and put it into the bash script um, to see if it worked. <clears throat> well, it didn't quite work, uh, which I kind of expected. So take number two, we needed to support dumb init, have it exit properly um, with the correct exit code. Uh, well, that didn't quite work either. Uh, so there was a few other PRs needed to try to tweak this behavior, and it actually got into like the space of complicated signal handling. Um, each of these changes were actually quite scary because we were now running production batch jobs this way, um, and so at least one of these caused a production incident by terminating the wrong PID. Yeah. So if you find yourself writing a batch script with over 100 lines of code, asking yourself, whose PID is it anyway, um, and you have hundreds of lines of complicated signal handling logic, maybe you're working in the wrong abstraction layer. And so let's just try solving it in Kubernetes. Fine. Uh, so again, I like look this up because that's what I do. And oh, sidecar containers, that seems legit. Uh, there's like a ton of people that want to support this. And it's going to be in Kubernetes, but it's going to be in 117. And it's an API change, so I can't really backport it safely to previous versions. So I guess I'm going to try to fork Kubernetes. And I asked the internet what they thought. <laughs> I got the most horrified response possible. Uh, but I was like, OK, OK, so I'm not forking Kubernetes. I'm just patching it, you know, very different. Uh, and, and actually, I did have to set up this whole thing where we uh, pull like the latest Kubernetes stable version that we're using, and then we run it as a CI CD pipeline that like applies GitHub patches to the stable release. So not forking, okay? It's like a very sophisticated process. 
Um, but you will find that the Kate's code base evolves quickly. Um, there's major cluster upgrades that need to be carefully performed and like pulling in all of these changes for like one key use case that you need to support may not make as much sense. Um, and you may just have use cases that end up being ahead of the curve and that's fine. So of course I looked this up. Has anyone else had this problem? And it turns out Lyft had the problem. So they actually had their patch just hanging around in their open source um, Kubernetes fork. Uh, and so yeah, let's see how their patch works. Basically you have a pod with a bunch of containers. You have your main service container, a bunch of sidecar helper containers. And the patch is in Kubelet. So if you annotate the containers as standard or sidecar, then the logic in Kubelet has been modified to en enforce that sidecar containers start before the standard container and shut down after them, which is kind of exactly the behavior we want here. And it supports many other use cases. Uh, so one of the things we used this for was just service discovery containers. So um, it works really well there, actually. Uh, and so the takeaway here is to just solve your problem at the appropriate, appropriate abstraction level. Uh, and that may even be patching your behavior into Kubernetes itself. Right. Next problem I want to talk about we'll call service mesh speeding accidents. So at Airbnb, we use a service discovery system called SmartStack, which we open sourced in 2013. And SmartStack has a number of components, and I'm not going to cover it in much detail, but at its core, it involves every pod having an HA proxy sidecar container that is its outbound or reverse proxy. Uh, and the SmartStack system will periodically update the HA proxy config and restart it to keep, keep things up to date. Unfortunately, uh, restarting HA proxy is memory intensive. The way that works is HA proxy forks, it starts a new copy of itself, taking up all, all uh, equivalent amount of memory as the first copy. The original copy will finish any outstanding connections that are running and then terminate. So your memory usage can double when HA proxy is running, or if your connections are long-lived and your service mesh is changing frequently, you might have a lot of HA proxies running and run into <laughs> an out of memory issue. <clears throat> so we have this problem, had this problem, saw some outages related to this. We came up with a simple fix. Just wait a little bit. So we, have our, we slow down our service mesh, our service discovery, so that we only restart HA proxy no more often than once every 30 seconds. So you can see where this is going, right? <clears throat> Kubernetes has this great feature where it can deploy really, really fast. And developers don't like waiting, so they crank up max surge for the deployment strategy. And you can actually deploy your whole service in less than 30 seconds. And the service mesh can't keep up. So each time a service would deploy, we'd see these spike of errors uh, calling into that service. And so you see this error spike with every deploy. Our fix for that so far is this kind of hacky solution, which is basically to just tell Kubernetes to slow down the termination of pods on deploy. You add a pre-stop hook to sleep and wait long enough for your service mesh to catch up and figure out what happened. Uh, Kubernetes will, uh, this will put the pod in a determinating state. And Kubernetes will actually delete it in that state by default after 30 seconds. So you also need to set termination grace period seconds. And once you have those two settings and you kind of tweak it a little bit, you can get the pods to survive long enough to, keep your, to, to, to stay around until your service mesh catches up with what happened. So our takeaway, Kubernetes deploys can cycle pods super fast whether the rest of your infrastructure can keep up or not. Next up, monster daemon sets. So why do you want a daemon set anyway? Uh, suppose you have a pod that needs to download a large amount of data every time it starts. It'd be convenient if you could use a daemon set to just make sure the data is there every time your pod is scheduled onto that node. For example, we have gigs of translation data or search index data and many pods that need that data. Uh, so a daemon set, sure, I'll solve that for you. The reality is that the daemon set's kind of flaky. So he kind of just steps outside when he's deploying, um, and the pod's like, but wait, I kind of am still running. I still need you to be around. Uh, also, oops, I died. The daemon set goes unhealthy or just dies and doesn't come back. That pod, again, is still running and expecting the daemon set to also be running. So one thing we tried, OK, well, maybe a daemon set isn't the right solution here. What if we try a deployment and use this neat feature called Pondifinity to try to schedule the service pods and the translation data pods on the same node? Um, but there's some gotchas with Pondifinity. 
uh, for example, if you want like preferred during execution or required during execution, you're making a trade off of, well, they're not always scheduled together or they are always scheduled together and if your cluster can't keep up, you're like full of scheduler errors now. So we didn't really like that, okay? So we, we thought of another idea which is, let's use the daemon set and then there's another Kubernetes feature called taints and tolerations. So taints is a way to say, you know, don't schedule on this node during these conditions. So maybe we can taint on pod readiness. Um, but one thing we were thinking about was, you know, supporting a very complex cluster. We didn't really want to have daemon sets being scheduled on and off on different nodes. So the complexity for us was just kind of not worth it. And even setting all of that aside, there was another really big problem with daemon sets. So we have our legacy, um, our first cluster, which has over 2,000 nodes. Um, and if you want to have a daemon set and that runs on every single node, you're looking at over 2,000 pods. Um, and so it's quite easy for it to take up a huge amount of space on your cluster. So I'll go through like a real example of how that can go quite badly. So I'm going to create and deploy a daemon set workload. This is actually me, Melanie, I did this. <laughs> um, I just wanted to test something out and uh, see what happens. Um, I'm trying to adjust some behavior uh, and I give it like a typical, like the typical resources that a Java service uses. Cool. Uh, and then like 10 minutes later, someone on our site reliability team messaged me saying, hey, uh, I noticed you deployed a daemon set uh, there's now thousands of pods that are getting um killed, and etcd is filling up with all of these events, and the whole cluster is going down. Uh, and so I was like, wow, that was actually really easy. I guess I didn't think that through that much. So the whole cluster was like, you know, I mean, we, we saved it, but it was kind of dicey. So for this particular use case, we're like, maybe let's just try the sidecar model again. That seemed to work okay. Uh, and in fact, maybe we should use admission controller to introduce some friction around creating daemon sets, because it seemed pretty easy to just take everything down. Uh, and of course, there are use cases for daemon sets and other special node behavior, so we'll just create dedicated, smaller, special clusters for services that need that special behavior. Um, and that actually worked pretty well for us. So the main takeaway here was just that daemon sets, you know, they can actually just take down your cluster in a way that's harder for other workloads to. Next topic, where's my Docker image? So at Airbnb, we make a lot of Docker images. We're generating more than two, th two million Docker images a day. And we mainly use ECR for this, Amazon's uh, Elastic Container Registry. But ECR is great, but it has a limit of 10,000 images per repository. So we need some way of making sure that we don't overflow our ECR repos. Now, ECR does provide a feature called lifecycle policy that allows you to manage uh, how, uh, how many images you have in each repository. But lifecycle policy only lets you limit the number of images and apply deletion policy based on least recently used or total number of images. It doesn't have any way of accounting for the images that you're currently using. So if you have a fast growing repo, but you're currently using a single image, say the one you're using in production, there's no way of telling it don't delete that one. And so ECR lifecycle policy is not enough. We came up with a simple, relatively simple idea. We'll, run a, we'll write a program, we call it ECR Cleaner. It works basically like this. It runs once a day as a cron job. It finds all the images that are in use by calling something like kubectl get deployments and looking for all the image IDs in use. And then for each ECR repository, delete, delete images down to some threshold, but, but skipping the ones that are in use. So that worked pretty well for a while until a couple things went wrong. <clears throat> Almost every line of this went wrong. Uh, first one was CI failures uh, due to some sort of Docker image error. We dig into this and discover ultimately the root cause is that first part of this ECR cleaner. It only runs once a day and amazingly, we were generating more than 10,000 images a day in CI. Now that I say it out loud, it doesn't actually sound like that much, but it was pretty surprising when it, we crossed that threshold. <clears throat> so even our ECR cleaner wasn't sufficient. We came up with this great solution. <laughs> <laughs> Run the ECR cleaner even more frequently, uh, and eventually we're gonna probably generate more than 10,000 images per hour, and then we're gonna have to come up with something else, but this is holding for right now. The next problem we ran into manifested like this. This is how these things manifest. They're kind of mysterious and take some tracking down. You rotate a Kubernetes minion node and suddenly the service is down. And the reason why is because the last remaining pods of that service that had workable images were on that one node and the images are gone from ECR. 
Why did that happen since we have this cleaner? Well, find all images in use was only checking the cube deployments in the cluster where the ECR cleaner was running. <clears throat> but now we're a multi, we have a multi-cluster solution. In fact, we have over 30 clusters and it wasn't checking all the other clusters. So, <clears throat> that, so we need to, to rewrite this find all images in use to actually find all images in all clusters that are in use. But that presents a problem too. Where do you run the ECR cleaner? Because you want to have isolation between your various Kubernetes clusters, the ECR cleaner really needs to be a global singleton. It needs to know about all images in use in all clusters. So where does it run? We solve this by adding a new cluster. <laughs> <clears throat> so we create a cluster we call the management cluster which has permission to access the API servers of every other cluster, and then we have a more strict review process for services that run in the management cluster. So the takeaway, why can't I hold all these Docker images? Make sure to keep track of your Docker images. Cool, <clears throat> next up, to init or not to init, that is the question. So we have a runtime configuration service that propagates value changes to applications within seconds. Think of like turning on or off features or adjusting experiments. Um, and we kind of need a way to support that in Kubernetes. So we have a runtime config agent container which sits in our pod and it pulls the runtime config service for configuration updates. But our pod actually needs that data, data before it starts, otherwise the service will crash. So let's split the logic and do an initial update in an init container and then have the runtime config agent pull continuously for more updates. Oh, but to pull in the latest dynamic configuration, we actually need to communicate with runtime config service, which requires service discovery, which definitely doesn't exist during the initialization phase. Uh, and so therefore, um, you know, the first approach of this is Let's have the init container set up its own service discovery. That seems like a great idea. Uh, yeah, it's not. Uh, so it was like, yeah, so the way the init container worked is it started up the network proxy and then uh, ran its logic to pull the data and then like shut down the network proxy. Uh, this was complex, pretty brittle, slow, and then obviously had a significant footprint on our uh, service discovery infra. So not ideal. Uh, but we have sidecar ordering now, so let's just throw this at that problem. Surely this will solve it. Let's just make runtime config agent and network proxy sidecars. Uh, but then, uh, you know, we still aren't guaranteeing that the network proxy is up before the runtime config agent. So it's possible that the runtime config agent itself can still not connect to the network proxy if it's ready first. Okay, so what do we do? Um, we can add logic to the runtime config agent sidecar to just wait for the network proxy sidecar to be ready with the wrapper script. So as some kind of logic that says, you know, continuously uh, pull for uh, runtime config service. If it can now successfully connect to runtime config service, then let's get that initial update um, and then begin polling. So takeaway, you might need ordering between sidecars too. And you might say, hey, Melanie, you didn't solve that directly in Kubernetes. You used another bash script, to which I challenge you to please write a topological sort patch for sidecar ordering. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, please let us know when you've, uh, when you've got that. <clears throat> Next up, where's my custom resource? So custom resources are great, and at Airbnb we use them a lot, uh, especially to keep track of resources external to the Kubernetes cluster but that are associated with a service, such as its storage, its dashboard, its alerts, its AWS resources like IAM roles, and so forth. Uh, one challenge with using custom resources is knowing when the deploy has completed. We want to be able to determine whether a deploy is completed or not and whether the custom resource changes were applied successfully or not. So we came up with this kind of simple idea. We'll make use of the status field in the resource, right? Simple, kubectl, kubectl apply will set the status to pending. The, the controller will wake up when it receives the new custom resource. It will apply the changes and then it'll change the status to either ready or error. And this is really convenient. Uh, it's easy for the, for the controller to know when it needs to run. It just checks to see if the status is pending. And it's easy for an operator manually to check and see what happened. You can just do kubectl get, and the status is at the bottom and is kind of human readable. So that's great, except that it doesn't work. <laughs> or it did work. It worked up until Kubernetes version 1.12. After 1.12, only controllers can modify the status field of resource objects. 
kubectl apply can no longer make those changes. So this was great. It worked until it didn't. It, uh, and it actually was pretty difficult to determine that this was going on. It was, a kinda, it was an insidious, nasty outage where what happened is that new resources would apply and work fine, right? But any changes to existing custom resources would silently succeed because they would still look like they were in ready state, but the controllers would never run on them because they never got reset back to pending state by kubectl apply, which incidentally succeeds but doesn't make the change. So this was a pretty gnarly outage caused by this change in, in, uh, that we determined as part of the Kubernetes upgrade when we upgraded past uh, uh, 1.12. So here's our solution now. Uh, what, what's different in 1.12, Kubernetes now provides you a field spec metadata generation, which is an integer auto-incrementing provided by Kubernetes itself. <clears throat> so when you update a resource, Kubernetes will change that generation from, say, 1 to 2 when you do your kubectl apply. The status still stays the same. You can't change that part. And this is, at least gives you some facility to figure out what's going on with your custom resources, but it's, it's not enough, right? How does your controller know whether it's operated on generation two or not? So here's our Airbnb solution. We add in the status field an observe generation, which is the last generation that the controller has run on. Now the controller updates. When it, when it sees a new version of the resource, it'll, if the generation doesn't match the observed generation, it'll reapply the changes and update the status field. And this works for now, which is good, but the user interface for manual inspection is still quite a bit worse. When you do kubectl get, well, on the slide, I've put these two lines pretty much right next to each other, but there might be hundreds of lines of spec in between, and you kind of have to manually eyeball to see that those things are, are updated. So not as good as it used to be, but uh, still works. That's our, that's our stopgap. So our takeaway, knowing when a deploy is complete and if it succeeded or not is tricky. Cool. Next up, I can't believe I have all the node's resources. You probably see where this one is going. So before Kubernetes, it was a simple time, simple place. I got one service on one instance. My instance is pretty big. It's got 72 gigs, and the JVM allocates me 72 gigs. So that works out pretty well. In Kubernetes, you have multiple co-located services running in pods, and the JVM gives you 72 gigs, and you 72 gigs, and you 72 gigs, and now suddenly you're out of memory. Um, and it's the same thing for CPU. So all kinds of problems. Um, and the problem is that older versions of the JDK um, are not aware of C groups. Uh, and so, okay, well, I guess we're running a really old JDK. We should probably upgrade it. Um, it's solved in newer versions, and uh, it knows how to allocate resources based on the container and not the node. Um, so we kind of like did an investigation just to make sure this was the case. So here's a real graph of a service uh, tracking its P95 latency. Um, after the upgrade, the latency went down. And for its worth, we tried a few other flags and things that didn't really seem to help us. Um, so that seemed to work pretty well. Uh, so now the GVM gives your pod the correct amount of CPU. Uh, but this service has a concurrency bug that gets worse uh, the less CPU uh, that is allocated to you based on the thread pool. Oh, OK. So basically, downgraded to the correct amount of CPUs uh, actually exposed an application race condition, which led to an outage. So uh, yeah, and here's the, here's the real evidence of the outage. Um, basically, it was like really slow requests as they started to hit the race condition more. Uh, and therefore, when upgrading you know, the JDK or any other language framework, you, know, you have to just pay attention to these sorts of problems. It's actually another major upgrade that you're taking on. Um, so cool, application owner, please use Canary and test it in 24 hours before you know, rolling out to the rest of production. Uh, and so this is not specific to Java services. So you're like, yeah, yeah, Melanie, you know, this is like KubeCon 2016. Everyone already knows about that. Uh, but I guess the reason I, I kept it in here is because it just, it just keeps happening. So like with other language frameworks and sidecars and stuff. Uh, and so I think it's just something that you should just always have in your back pocket of maybe, hmm, maybe that's what's happening here. Uh, so like another example is when we first started experimenting with Envoy, we uh, noticed that it set concurrency to the number of CPUs on the underlying host by default. That sounds familiar. Like probably that's going to cause contention on the host. So like we had to we had to like set the concurrency to be way lower. Uh, so the takeaway there is just to like be aware of language frameworks and sidecars that are not aware of these container abstractions. 
um, and you know that you might be signing yourself up for more upgrades. You know when you when you upgrade to containers, Kubernetes. All right, next, auto scale Ocalypse. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so auto scaling is great. You're probably hearing me using this a lot. I love all these Kubernetes features until they don't work. Uh, so auto scaling, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, the way auto scaling works is it creates a new resource called a horizontal pod auto scaler, which monitors your deployment. And whenever the average CPU of your deployment deviates from a set value, it'll add or remove pods. So keep your utilization uh, approximately flat. Now, suppose you have a service like this. You have a service that consumes a lot of CPU on start, say for initialization. In our case, we have some services that go through a startup phase that we call JVM warmup, where they replace synthetic traffic in order to populate their in-memory cache, to establish connections in their connection pools, to fill up thread pools, et cetera. This process takes a few minutes and uses essentially 100% CPU while it's happening. So what happens with the autoscaler? So here's an example of a deploy of a service. Just what is the autoscaler doing? This service typically uses about 30 pods. Its autoscaler ranges from 20 to 200. And uh, you deploy, which surges and adds a few extra pods. They come in at 100% CPU and raise the CPU average, which causes the autoscaler to add some pods, which raises the CPU average, which causes the autoscaler to add some more pods. And in fact, will spike the number of pods almost all the way to the maximum allowed in this autoscale group, in this, uh, in this autoscaler. It's, the trajectory is that the autoscaler is adding pods so fast that, the, that all the ones that are coming in are still in their warm-up phase and still burning more CPU. So a service that typically runs in 30 pods will spike to 190 pods on every deploy. That's not great. But how do you fix this? It's not obvious. Like, surely there must be a setting from it for this. I hear you cry. <clears throat> right? Well, there used to be a setting for this. <clears throat> but it was removed with this cryptic comment in the documentation. Starting from 1.12, a new algorithmic update removes the need for upscale delay. So here's our embarrassing hack, how we work around this. Incidentally, there is a setting called horizontal pod autoscaler initial readiness delay, which sure seems like it's meant to address this problem, but it did not work for us. It did not help this problem at all. We tried even setting it as, long, as high as 15 minutes. So our really dumb hack is to ch set the pod autoscaler sync period. This essentially means we run the autoscaler only once every five minutes. And you really can't run it any less frequently than that, or you really risk the autoscaler not reacting to real traffic spikes. Um, and even with that setting, it doesn't fix the problem. It only mitigates the problem. So here's the same service deploying now, typically runs at 30 pods, still spikes to around 85 or 90 pods due to runaway autoscaling on every deploy. <clears throat> so our takeaway, autoscaling does not work well for services that burn a lot of CPU on start. OK, next up. Hey, my scheduled operation took down all services. So here's an excerpt from an actual operation. FYI, we are running an operation to upgrade StatsD agent in Kubernetes in a few minutes. There may be a few minutes where metrics are not available to services. And then a few minutes later, uh, I think all of my Kubernetes services are down right now. And they also don't have metrics, but mostly they're down. Uh, and so to kind of explain this one, just a brief overview of Kubernetes health checks. So health checks in Kubernetes, there's readiness probes and liveness probes. Readiness probes uh, don't send traffic to me if it fails. Liveness probes replace me if it fails. Um, and so, you know, when you think about a service container, uh, for us at least, most of the services just set both of these to slash health. So if it responds to slash health, it's probably healthy. And you can set, you know, more complex ones if you want. Uh, but in Kubernetes, health checking is per container. So you really have to think about all of these containers and how they contribute to your health check. Um, and so what should their health checks be? And like, w how should they affect you know, whether your whole pod is receiving traffic or not? So you know, a while ago, before this incident, we had already decided that we didn't want StatsD agent failing to take down our service. So our, our initial try was, OK, just don't set probes for non-critical containers. Uh, containers like logging, tracing, metrics, um, should not affect service health. So pretty easy, right? Just don't set the probes. 
Well, we didn't know that a caching container fails its readiness check. Uh, regardless of whether you delete all the probes or not, uh, it will still fail the readiness check. Uh, and so when Statsy agent crashed, um, it failed its readiness check. And at the time, our service mesh logic basically had a loop like this. Uh, so is pod, is pod ready true? Uh, for each container status in the pod, if it's not ready, the pod's not ready. Um, and then at the end of this whole loop, if the pod's ready, publish that it's ready so that it can receive traffic. So if any one of the containers are unready, the whole pod isn't ready to receive traffic. So in this case, our crashing stats, the agent container, which became unready, caused all of the pods in our cluster to become unready. Not great. So the next solution uh, was basically, well, let's just like, hack this logic into our service mesh. So we mark containers that we don't want to be considered for pod readiness as non-critical. Um, and here's the example again, logger, tracing, stats D, there's more. Um, and so these ones are just not considered. And then we just add one line to our service discovery logic that basically says, don't consider containers that are non-critical. Um, we've also considered other solutions here. Um, this has just been like kind of one of the stopgap solutions, um, but it's like definitely evolving. Uh, and so regardless of what your solution is, I think the main takeaway here is just be careful when configuring health checks for pods, especially keep in mind you know, how containers affect your overall pod health and how crashing sidecar containers are not ready. Next, scheduling is easy and fun. <clears throat> so this is an example of a deploy of a service that runs in three availability zones. Turns out the Kubernetes scheduler is not very good at AZ balancing. In fact, it's really bad at AZ balancing. Uh, it appears, and this is speculation, I haven't really looked too closely at the code, but it appears that in each sort of round of scheduling, it will assign all of the pods it's trying to create to a single AZ. So if you have a fairly large max surge, and you surge a set of pods at once, they seem to all land in one AZ at once. So deploys will tend to knock services completely out of balance. And we do a lot of AZ-aware routing. So when our services are out of balance like this, it can cause you know, significant problems in our infrastructure. So the scheduler doesn't do what we want. So we'll write a con how will we solve this? We'll write a controller. So we implement what we call our deployment pruner controller. And the way this controller works in our first attempt to fix this, we, write a, we have this controller. It checks for deployments that are out of AZ balance. And then it tries to cautiously delete pods until the deployment gets back into balance. Now, this has a couple of problems still, right? First of all, it's fighting with the scheduler. So it's deleting pods, the scheduler's putting the pods back, but the scheduler's still not putting them back in AZ balance necessarily. You want this to run fairly quickly so that you can get back into balance quickly, but you don't want to kill pods too quickly because you don't want to you know, jeopardize the service running. And also, if you delete too many pods at once, the scheduler does the wrong thing. You can see in this example, this went from out of balance in one AZ to out of balance in a different AZ as the scheduler kind of fought with the pruner. And the whole process is pretty slow. In this example of a deploy, it took over four hours for the service to get back into AZ balance within uh, one cluster. So this is kind of, this was a stopgap solution, but really not a very good one. So as Melanie pointed out earlier, some of the time you just need to fix this in Kubernetes. So we've created a couple of patches to fix this. One's been merged. One is still open, so if some of you want to, someone here can help us get that accepted, that'd be really nice. These fix the problems, fix the ulti ultimately fix the bug in the scheduler itself so that it distributes pods correctly to maintain AZ balance. <clears throat> Fortunately, in the case of the scheduler, you don't have to fork, or excuse me, patch Kubernetes. <laughs> there's a workaround. You can just change the Docker image of the scheduler. So there's a silver lining. You don't have to run a completely patched version of Kubernetes. You can just kind of poke in this change and get an upgraded scheduler. So the takeaway, you may need to make fixes to the Kubernetes scheduler itself, but you can upload, at least you can easily upload them as a custom image. Cool. So if you've been asleep up to this point, now is the time to wake up and take a picture. Uh, I'll wait. Uh, here's 10 takeaways from 10 weird ways to blow up your Kubernetes. Okay, that's enough of you. 
<laughs> so thank you. Uh, we're hiring. You can learn more at medium.com slash Airbnb-engineering, Airbnb.com slash careers. You can contact us on Twitter at these various Twitter handles. Um, and just a quick plug, directly after this talk, uh, ben Hughes will be in the room next door talking about scaling Kubernetes to thousands of nodes across multiple clusters calmly. Uh, and if you want to hear more about basically ways to blow up your Kubernetes, but specifically focusing on latency, tomorrow our coworkers Jin and Steven will be talking about did Kubernetes make my P95s worse? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat>